Today I am talking with Roseanne Liang, director of the new film Shadow in the Cloud. First of all, I loved this film. It was so clearly a film that champions women and clearly from the women perspective. So just to uh, knock any elephants in the room out of the way, could you clarify a bit on the timeline of you getting a script that was not originally your work, but it, it was very clearly rewritten sufficiently. Cause I could tell like, no, this is, this is telling a woman's story from the firsthand experience of being a woman. Yes. Um, okay. So in 2018, um, I, I had really acquired representation in Hollywood and I wanted to make my mark as an action director. Um, so this script came across my desk. It was written by one Max Landis. Um, we did not know the depth and breadth of his alleged crimes at that time. That came later after we'd finished shooting the movie. Um, but um, the producer that brought the script to me had worked with Max before and felt that maybe it would be best if we didn't work with Max. Um, so I did not meet him. I have not spoken to him. I've had no contact with him. He has no, he did not make this movie. Um, I, uh, he did write the, the first, the, all the, I guess the script that I received. Uh, but I since have rewritten the script. It's not a page one rewrite, I'll admit. Uh, there are lots of elements from Max's script that remain in the movie. But I believe that, um, I worked enough on the script to uh, get a co-writer credit, and uh, and that's that's the timeline. Yeah, so we we made this movie, not him. So of course, the bulk of the film takes place in one location with one character, and that's really fascinating because it kind of reminded me of those old radio dramas uh, from like decades, decades past. Were you inspired by the vintage setting to make the film a bit more vintage? Because stylistically, it felt like there were a few things in there that really uh, felt more immersive to that period piece. Not just the fact that it's a period piece, but the artistic style of art from decades past. Yeah, I mean, the, the time period was already in the script when I received it, and, and, I, and I didn't want to excite it. I felt that this crucible of um, that she's sitting in this crucible of emotion and psychology and mental, you know, anxiety and trauma um, was something that was really crunchy and interesting uh, uh, foundation to tell the story, to tell the story of trauma and anxiety and also the great wells of strength that we can access when, uh, when, adverse, when we're faced with adversity. Um, so that, like, and, and then just researching that period and those planes, the beat, the, the, you know, the turret, the ball turret of a B-17 bomber, I learned things that were just insane about that time. It is a, it is a wonder of technology. Um, the, the way that, the way that it moves, the way that they, it guns, um, the, the, its dimensions alone, the fact that a man had to sit there with, and, you know, a small man had to sit with their legs up, up around their ears. It's confronting enough for a man to do it. It's more confronting for a woman to do it and also to put a camera in between her legs as well. So it's, um, it, it just felt like exactly the right setting to tell a story like this. Can you talk a bit about, um, I don't know who your cinematographer was. I probably should have written their name down. That was my bad. But you have these establishing shots where when she's in her little space and she's talking to these men that she's only met briefly, and you have them say their names and you show them and the lighting is really gorgeous. It almost looks like a music video and it's such a small yeah. detail in the film, but I really loved those shots. So was there anything in particular that inspired that look and you know, the lighting and everything to do with it? Um, our cinematographer was Kit Fraser and he, um, I knew his work from another movie with Shadow in the Cloud, Under the Shadow with Baba Kanvari, which was a very different kind of tense um, movie. Um, uh, and and I think we came up with this idea of the the red and green happened very organically because of course those are the those those are the colours of port and starboard and, and planes. So the red and green came and then when we when we were ever wondering where to put the camera, um, we came up with this idea that we'd put the camera inside her head in a way. 
So when you see those men, that's her mind's eye view of the men. And that's her own anxiety because they're so, with those moving lights and, and with you were saying this, this music video feeling, um, it's quite confronting. Like they're looking right at her. They're barreling her and confronting her and interrogating her and second guessing her. And that's, that's in a way sometimes how we feel when we're in places that we're unsafe. And I'm not just, just talking women, I'm talking anyone. If anyone's in a place that's unsafe, you, you feel scrutinized, you feel judged, you feel looked at. Um, yeah, that, 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 that I felt was like a, when, when me and Kit uh, came up with this idea, um, that, that it was the psychology of that that, that really uh, came through, yeah. So I've been researching some of your other interviews that you've done for the film and you're often asked about the gremlin and of course I can say that that's a thing because it's in the marketing so it's not a spoiler. So there is no. that element of creature feature and of course when I when I first saw that that was going to be part of I hadn't seen the trailer before I saw the film. I went in completely blind right. and it was great. Um but you said that this was a thing that people back in decades past, they genuinely believed that gremlins were a threat to them on planes, which brought a whole new perspective to that Twilight Zone episode. So how did you go about learning that this was more than just kind of a, you know, oh, it's the tooth fairy where nobody actually really believes that it's real? Because that was fascinating to hear you talk about that. Yeah, I mean, the, the researching the history of gremlins and the gremlin lore is fascinating. You know, Roald Dahl, one of my favorite, of many people's favorite childhood authors, had written a, a gremlin story that Disney was going to make into a movie around that time, but it didn't happen. And so that's why in this day and age, you know, our, our most um, ready access to gremlin lore is through the Steven Silver produced movie from the 80s. Um, that was a movie that I grew up with and scared me horribly when I was when I was a child as well. But then going back to the lore, um, I didn't realize that gremlins are to um, World War P uh, Air Force uh, pilots what aliens are to Roswell in the 1950s. There is a rich and 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 well documented lore around gremlins and people swearing that they're real, like. That they were, but because a lot of things happen in the air, like it's the oxygen thin, it's really cold. Um, you're going through a lot of physical um, stress. Like you, one thing we 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 talk to old timers who who you know who fought in the war or who had researched people who fought in the war, and you had to pee where you sat. Uh, it was mostly men, and they just they just they had to pee. They had to sit in their pee, and it was really cold. And they, they you know, that they, there's the intense stress of of the combat and all of that. And stuff can, I'm sure, stuff can play with your mind up there. But they, people saw gremlins, and they even drew diagrams the same way that people draw draw diagrams of aliens at Roswell. Um, the, you know, these bat-like winged creatures with red eyes, and um, that was that was wild to to find out that research. Mm. So with filming one single character in such a small space, did you feel like it forced you to be more creative? Was it limiting? Uh, you know, because it's really unique to the filmmaking process because there's only so many angles and so many distances that you can do on a character that's supposed to be in this very limited sphere. Yeah, it was certainly a technical challenge that I didn't quite realize how technical it would be. Um, yes, it's, it's, uh, I think that was already something that, that producers and, and myself were nervous about with scripts is that the first 40 pages are just one person. And, and of course I could have cut to the other people, but I didn't really want to. I felt like, again, if we're going to be true to this woman's experience if what we're trying to build is an empathetic connective tissue between the viewer and 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 Maud Garrett then we should never cut away from her because she it's her point of view that is privileged and it's her point of view that's going to mess with our perspective and create the tension that 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 I that I love in, in movies like this um so yes it was certainly a challenge um but I think Chloe I mean I uh, I'd record, you know, she 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 went through a lot to to bring this movie to us. Um, she she's actually claustrophobic. She had to deal with her real phobia. Like I could see her shaking sometimes when she was in that enclosed space. She was in that for ten to twelve hours a day. 
she um, she had to memorize 12 to 15 pages. Like not, normally actors have, you know, they don't need to learn scenes so long, but because this film is essentially one long scene, um, she she had to sit and do 15 pages in one take. Um, and then we had to move the camera again. She had to do another 15 pages in one take. And then, so really we didn't have that many takes per camera set up, but, um, but she had to go through a lot. So dealing with the physical and, and psychological uh, issue of claustrophobia, plus the, you know, just general body pain of being in such a cramped position with a camera, you know, in, a, in an enclosed space, plus the, you know, the technical aspects of knowing, you know, continuity wise what her hands are doing what her face is doing what her head is doing uh, because she's got knobs to play with and you know it, it, all, all of that um was was a was a real challenge for all of us but then when I took the rushes into the edit suite that's when the footage started to come alive in a way that I didn't even realize when when she was doing it little micro expressions in her face she's just so eminently watchable I've watched her hundreds if not a thousand times and uh i i never got i never got sick of her which is which is a mean thing to say about you know the, the process but sometimes you do sometimes you just get tired of watching it over and over again mm -hmm. i never did with her when i watched the film her character and her performance really reminded me of Linda Hamilton in Terminator 2. It's very specific to Terminator 2 because you know in the first film she's just the fish out of water, she doesn't know what's going on. But in the second film it's like she can fight and you know you better not get in her way. But another thing is that she's a, a deeply emotional, visceral character. What do you think is um the importance of I don't I don't know how to ask this question in an eloquent way, but the difference between you know kind of the the cold strong female archetype in action versus a realistic human portrayal of a woman in action. What were you aware of of how to make sure that you're not falling into that kind of stereotype and to make it more human, like Linda Hamilton in Terminator Two. I mean, that's the highest praise you could give me. I like, I'm sorry, like Terminator 2 is one of my all time favorite movies and, um, and same with Aliens. Um, and we could argue about whether Aliens or Alien is the better movie, but, uh, one thing is clear is that Ripley is uh, amazing in both movies. Um, but, um, yeah, I think I, uh, what, what, what me and Chloe were drawn to were messy superheroes and and I don't mean superheroes as in flying superheroes I mean every I mean grounded superheroes because that's what Linda Hamilton and 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 um, Sigourney Weaver are in those movies they are messy they are selfish they are self-serving and yet we're rooting for them because in a way that's what life is for us right now everyone especially this year has gone through some form of trauma and um and, and 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 we fight through and we're not our best selves but we still you know we still access these vast wells of strength i think strength and rage and and and, and fear but courage you know all those things mesh together we we as humans we have access to all of that and this is what I, you know this is not a this is not a feminist movie in that it's just for women this is a movie for anyone who has ever suffered trauma and overcome it, who has ever found that they have wells of strength inside of themselves that they didn't realize that they had, um, that are unlocked by adversity. Like I, I really, that's really important to me, I think, is that, you know, um, Terminator 2 was not a movie for women. It's a, it's sure, it's got an amazing female character, but men and women can really put themselves in, in Sarah Connor's shoes. Um, and hopefully, I really hope that people can do the same with them, um, with Maud Garrett. Mm. I was trying to research a bit into your background as an artist and of course you're originally from New Zealand and you're like myself, you're Asian diaspora. Do you feel like being multicultural makes you a more creative artist? Because I notice in this film we have a blending of so many different genres and so many different kind of socio-political issues and we as multicultural people, we live in this perpetual state of a mix of influences that form who we are as people. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, there's this there's the caveat which says um, it's the person outside of a culture who can most um, accurately or objectively talk about it, or, or you know, it it takes. I I think I with you know being an Asian diasporic person and feeling like my feet are in two different places at the same time. I've I never feel so foreign as I do when I'm in China. And they realize that I can't speak Mandarin. And they go, oh, you're a person who's lost their culture. And then I feel at home in New Zealand, but then occasionally, you know, people will just call you racial epithets for no good reason. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this, this is our this is our existence. This is something that's, ha- that's happened to me, since, and I'm sure it's happened to you too, where you're you feel like you're at home. You feel like you're you're in your own skin and everything's fine. And then someone will suddenly call you a name, and you'll be like, "Oh wait, they see me as not of this place, and and maybe I'm not." So I think existing outside or or existing in a in a a liminal space, <laughs> if I'm going to bring back my women's studies 101, um, is is useful to a creative. Absolutely, I, I I'm. And and I like to think that I'm I'm on the cusp of a lot of things. Like I'm I'm on the Aries Pisces cusp, and I'm on the I'm a exennial. You know, I'm not a millennial or a Gen X, or I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, and I love I love the liminal. I love the in between spaces because because um, I find them more creative and more interesting. Yeah. Was this your first big? studio sort of feature film because I was also like I said I was doing my research that's so, is that so Asian I, mean, I was thank doing you. my homework and no you, I mean great. <laughs> thank you well because you had a uh, you had done some work with doing web series so I, then I yes. was you know wondering all these things about did you go to film school or did you just kind of jump into creating online and then you know what is that transition going from the, you know all the control that comes from just creating yourself and posting it directly online versus going through a studio system and just the larger scale of everything so as much as you'd like to share about that and your background um well i mean i uh, i did i did study i'm 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 a classic asian nerd as well um de- originally destined for medical school but then got seduced by the dark arts when i took a year uh when i deferred a year before i was going to do uh, pre-med um and uh yeah i have a master's in, in film whatever that means in screenwriting and directing um but i uh, my first film was an independent romantic comedy which was um about um uh, my my identity uh, my identity crisis my parents didn't approve of my choice of partner um who happened to be caucasian and i made a film about that i made a documentary about that first and then um, I was picked up um, by a studio in New Zealand to make that um, into into uh, my first narrative feature film. Um, uh, but then I realised that action was always my first love. Like as a kid, that's why I go to the cinemas. That's the movies. Those are the VHSs that are worn out uh, at home. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, since having a family, since um, I've got two kids now, and and uh, time is short. So <laughs> I better go for the things that I want. And, and what I want is to be an action director. If it happens for me, it happens. If it doesn't, you know, there's those, those cheesy things you say. It's about the climb. It's not necessarily about the distant destination. But um, certainly making this movie is, is, is base camp one, at least, I think. And uh, I'm, quite, I'm quite delighted that I got to do this um, now. I think the misconception about the action genre is that it's not as emotional or not as character driven, whereas your film, Shadow in the Cloud, is both of those, it's very emotional and it's very character driven. So how do you approach creating story and you know, how does it if, um, influence your style as a director to make sure that it does have those elements instead of just the visual spectacle of action? In a way, the visual spectacle and the, all this, that's the easy part. You know, I feel like it's not, it's not easy, but, 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 but there are ways to do it. And, and there's so many pathways that people have forged to make beautiful pictures. Um, the tough part is character and meaning and heart. That's the thing. And, and people who dismiss action films as uh, shallow, haven't really loved action, I think. Um, when, when we talk about Terminator 2, when we talk about Aliens, when we talk about Leon the Professional, 
the, these are movies that, that do have a beating heart and, and, and a layered meaning. And, and, uh, in a way, the action and the genre synergizes the heart and meaning in a way that I guess, not that I, not that I have a, anything against drama, that in a way that drama doesn't. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, the, I mean, the, the reason why Marvel has reached so many people, why superhero and comics have reached so many people is not just because of the glamour and the, and the fighting. It's because they access something that's in our hearts. They speak to a truth. They speak to an experience. They speak to connectivity. And to me, that's what cinema is about. Um, cinema is a magic that connects people. When it really works, it connects people. And, you know, I, I'm proselytizing from my, from my mountain, but that's why I got into movies because it is the most effective and empathetic delivery of story known to humans. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to put it out there. Um, it, it, to me, that there, there is no more connective magic than sitting in a cinema and feeling like a stranger or a group of, or a crew of strangers have made something that sees you and speaks to you. That's uh, that's a magic unlike any other that humans have created. Mm. I also really like how Shadow in the Cloud addresses many important issues. You know, sexism, sex in the work, sexism in the workplace, um, and some other things that I won't specify because of plot spoilers, but. Uh, <laughs> I find that when you have, whether it's a an action film or something genre, you know, sci-fi, horror, whatever, that incorporates those things, it kind of alleviates the burden emotionally on the viewer who's like experienced those issues firsthand. So is that part of why you maybe prefer these other genres of storytelling instead of just doing a straightforward kind of like kitchen sink drama about domestic violence or something like that. Yeah, and in a way the genre is a delivery device. I I, I think of it less as vegetables in the dessert than um, a dish is, is delicious when it's more substantive. Do, do you know what I mean? Like it's not it's not about hiding the vegetables at all because the ve because vegetables taste delicious sometimes when they cook properly. Do you know what I mean? Sorry to bring this to the uh, food thing. Um, but it's that time of year when I think about food a lot. Um, but uh, when, when you think about movies like Get Out, right? Why, why, why did those movies live on and are imminently rewatchable and mean so much to us as people? They mean so much to us because the genre synergized with meaning and created something that was possibly more digestible than I don't know blunt force trauma if you know if you know what I mean um, it's the, it's about the layers if you wanted to switch off and enjoy a horror movie you can do that but if you wanted to see behind that and 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 come back with a more substantive dish there's that too forget out so it's it's just genre is not artifice genre is a is a synergizing tool i think that for me it is anyway that because those are the movies that i come back to mm. yeah so two final questions i'll try to keep them brief uh could you talk a bit about developing the action as far as combat goes and you know whomever you collaborated with to do that and then the second question is um one of the characters in the ensemble is polynesian and hopefully it's okay for me to say this, they don't die at the end of the film. <laughs> so do you wanna maybe touch a bit on allowing the only non-white person in the cast to survive the, you know, the violence and whatnot? Cause usually <laughs> we, we die usually before, yeah. before the credits roll. So action and uh, not uh, dying at, uh, before not, the end. Not a dying Samoan person. Um, yeah, so I mean, it was it was really, I mean, this was something that wasn't in the script. Um, the the forces were very strictly uh, segregated. The, the US forces were very strictly segregated. Um, so the only way that we could have a person of color amongst the crew of men was by bringing in the allied forces, New Zealand type thing. And we researched this deeply. There were Samoan pilots um, and we chose Samoan because Bula himself is Samoan. 
um, we could have made a Māori. Beulah has played, played many Māori before, but we just felt that, and, and there was a whole, you know, there's a whole history of, of, of Māori battalions and Māori Air Force people, but, um, but we decided to be true to Beulah's heritage. Um, and he, of course, he's a New Zealand Samoan actor who's making inroads, you know, in, in, in um, North America as well, and Hawaii Five O, and a bunch of other projects as well, film projects that are coming out soon. Um, so it was it, it was a chance to be able to work with him, uh, one of our best and, and brightest New Zealand stars, and also put a person of colour. But we also made sure to be true to the history of of, the, of this as well. Um, and and you know the whole not dying thing was something that was definitely on my mind because um a lot of the men well no god i shouldn't even say that but anyway yes he didn't die yeah <laughs> and he, he worked he works together he works together and uh he collaborates with the main character to do things that help the movie go to a close mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so so I was I was so happy to be able to do that and to be supported in doing that by the producers. Um, and uh, I would love to work with Beulah again. I feel like it's almost a travesty to have him in such a small role. Um, he is capable of carrying a movie. So hopefully one day we, that can happen. Um, in terms of action, I'm an action design nerd. Like I, I me and my stunt coordinator, Tim Wong, uh, who is a, a, a Chinese New Zealander himself, and is, has worked on projects like James Gunn's Suicide Squad, and um, it, he worked on Mad Max Fury Road as well. Um, we are action nerds, and we will obsessively watch scenes that we love over and over again to make sure that it, well, I, I see it as like a great, you know, a great musical number it doesn't just have the showy musical. It, it forwards character, theme, and story. And I feel the same with action. Every single beat of the action should forward character theme or story um, and and this is an interrogation of action design that me and my son coordinator do with every project that we, that we make together and we hope to do it on a on a on a more um, resource level as well in the future as well, as well. but um there is action in this movie with a non actor it's, I think I can say that um, and that was a creature feature yeah <laughs> yeah yeah with with the monster. <laughs> quite frankly and um and sure you know people can say that we we break physics in some ways because one minute the creature's pulling metal off a plane and the next minute uh it's being uh touched in the face by a woman um by a human woman um but i i mean we we hear stories of women of, of mothers lifting ba lifting cars off babies of doing superhuman feats of strength when when things um when things are on the line, when when important things are on the line, and uh, I I think it, logically we 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 justified it. So um, I feel like I'm ranting, but yes. No, that's uh, fascinating. I mean, I would keep you for longer, but I know you've got other yeah. things to do. So uh, thank you so much for coming on and talking to me about your film. Uh, you know, oh, whenever you so you're much. doing anything else, um, happy to chat again because I think yes, you're great. Yes. And I think you have a huge future ahead of you because I guess this was made in a rush with very little money and I, it did not come across like that. I didn't know that until oh. I started researching. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying, yeah, it means a lot.